I want to get into the waxing segment right now. Um, as you can imagine, uh, by cutting in our edges, and uh, if the skis are new, they're coming out of the machines at the factory uh, with some of the emulsion fluids to help cut the uh, cut the steel and the base at the factories. That it it leaves the bases fairly dirty, as well as uh, the dirt that you put in it by cutting in the edges. So whenever we're starting to condition the bases, we always want to make sure that we start with a clean base. Um, and uh, is everybody pretty much in here familiar with hot scraping as opposed to using uh, the harsher petroleum type base cleaners? Um, it just tends to, uh, to clean out the base better and you're using wax rather than a harsher uh, type of wax remover that's gonna pull out some of the properties that you actually need in that base, um, such as uh, polymers, um, malt, molybdenum, graphites, carbons, whatever that's in that base. Um, it's a good idea to, uh, to evaluate what type of base you have. 90% of the racing bases are all center bases that are made up of powder polymers and tend to be a lot more molecular. There's a lot more pores in these bases uh, than say some of the uh, harder bases, the, the extruded bases that don't tend to open up or expand and contract with the heat and the cooling of the ski, the heat of the iron and the cooling of the ski. Um, oxidized bases, which I just got into, if, uh, if there's not a lot of wax uh, going into the ski and it's all falling out of the ski, go ahead in and take them into Eric's rent stall and get them ground, get them freshened up so you can get a better application and a, a deeper type of wax, um, fat which equals into faster. Um, snow, uh, a ski in motion uh, possesses kinetic energy. And the more that this energy maintains, the faster it'll accelerate, okay? So there's other variables uh, that are thrown into uh, the ski, um, such as uh, which, which reacts to friction that's gonna take away from this. It adds to the friction. Um, the, the construction of the ski material, that tends to dampen those vibrations that you're putting in uh, the ski as far as a racing in, in harder situations. Uh, some materials have a reaction of taking that energy and quieting it down a lot more, keeping that ski above on track rather than distorting and skidding down, and which is a lower line. Um, dry friction, um, which is fairly common around here as far as having the snow uh, a lot drier, there's less humidity in the air, so obviously there's less humidity in the snow. The snow crystals are very small. They're about a half a millimeter to a millimeter big, and they tend to break down or transform uh, into like broken glass or shark's teeth rather than uh, where I live out in California where uh, this, the snow transformed in, into a rounder shape that makes it less, uh, less aggressive and, and not so much of a dry friction type of a, a snow. Um, the drier the snow, the more static is gonna be thrown into the ski also, the static electricity which also will in, uh, impair the, the kinetic energy and add to the friction. And also capillary suction would be another variable. All right, so a good reference, uh, you know, not only skiing in the snow, but are you able to reach down in the snow and make a snowball? Is the snow bonding or is it dry and not bonding and just falling apart? These are good references as opposed to uh, what you're going to be layering up with or training with in wax. And I'm kind of going through this quickly. Um, friction due to dirt, diesel, pollen oil, rock dust are basically atmospheric contaminants. The snow falling out of the sky is a lot filthier these days than it was back when things were a little bit better and it was cleaner. So there are, there are all types of variables out there that you know take into consideration when you're in here, know what's going on out there, all right? And that's a big help, all right? Um, getting back to, uh, to the TOCO system, I'm gonna go over this real quick. TOCO has a real, easy system, um, basically blue, red, and yellow. We go to zero to minus 30, huge, or pardon me, minus 10 to minus 30 uh, for your hard, drier, uh, dry, aggressive, snow, dry friction type conditions. Um, your red, which is minus four to minus 10. 
um, which is pretty much the norm out west. Uh, you might want to go a little bit harder out here, obviously, uh, in a more normal type of way. We're out west. We really use a lot of S3 red, the hydrocarbon red. doesn't have any, any fluorinated any fluoros in it. So um, it, it has tremendous uh, conditioning properties, meaning that it's going to get that base nice and shiny and where you want it to be and more receptive, more adherent as you get closer to race season and starting to put some of your uh, high fluorinated waxes into. Okay? So that's kind of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, as well as your molly, um, which again, uh, is really important specifically out here for not only dry friction but for also for dirtier type snow. It has tremendous compounds in here that adds to the acceleration rather than the deacceleration of your glide that you're looking for. All right. And uh, before we get into this too much, I want to make sure and, uh, and have a clean ski. Um, does, uh, should I go over the hot scraping process? How many people want me to, I'm just trying to be time conscientious here. Um, if you're familiar with hot scraping, uh, making that ski clean, I'll go ahead and do it, all right? We'll spend time doing that. What's that? I'm happy with hot scraping. All right. Well, anyway, I'm just gonna do it because I saw a few hands here. Anyway, um, a dirty ski, we just finished cutting in our edges and we wanna make sure and clean this ski and we wanna start out with Really uh, getting into that structure and opening up that structure and digging in with a softer steel brush. A soft oval brush here is your best friend for pre-hot scraping and, uh, and also pre-layering, which I'm going to get to here shortly. Um, go ahead and make sure your ski's in the vise. I have to go ahead and make sure it's in the vise. <laughs> and uh, make sure you have some base techs in your pocket to, uh, to wipe off the impurities that you don't want in between the iron and the base, adding to more scratches. Um, so anyway, what I'll do is I'll take this softer steel brush and I'll really dig in and open up that steel and make that base a lot more porous so that wax will penetrate deeper. And uh, as the wax is, uh, is, the iron's heating up that wax, it tends to bring all those impurities up to the surface where we can go ahead and scrape them off. And I'll, I'll just do it once, uh, even though sometimes it takes uh, two, three, four times, depending on your reference, which is your wax that you're scraping off, how much dirt is in those scrapings. When you don't see any more dirt in the scrapings that you're taking off, which I'll demonstrate right now, that pretty much tells you that that ski is clean and uh, ready for the next conditioning layer. Um, go ahead and take your brushes off the bench when you're doing this. Um, yellow is the softer of the wax uh, in the Toco range and it has a lower melting point. Okay, um, melting points are very important. Um, not only uh, as the temperature range that you're looking for when that, that wax works, but right now we're, uh, we're cleaning out the base with the softer wax just to kind of get us to the heart of the matter in the, in the wax molten so we can accomplish, accomplish that cleaner ski faster than say a harder red or even a blue. Um, I wrote down the melting points, the temperature ranges, and also the hardnesses of each wax that we do have. And uh, again, uh, once, once I'm cleaning up here, I'm not going to go through it all because uh, right now we're kind of running out of time and I want to keep going. So uh, feel free to come up here and jot some of these down. Um, otherwise, they're all in the packages as far as the temperature ranges and the heat of the iron or the melting point, uh, which is your first reference to set that iron. Your yellow, which is the softer out of the two, is about 120 to 125 Fahrenheit. And the reason we're going to Fahrenheit here is because it's 110 volts and it's just as more applicable, applicable in, uh, in the U.S rather than using centigrade. Okay. On the website there's an info center and you click on the info center and there's a, there's a chart for temperature range. Right, also uh, www.tocous.com is a, uh, which I'm going to get to at the end of the segment, is a tremendous tool as far as reference goes. They have everything you possibly need uh, in the TOCO products to, to, as far as hardness, temperature range, uh, on, on the uh, 
melting point range on the iron and, and snow temperature ranges that these different waxes cover. All right, and then uh, as far as mixing goes, you can overlap those temperature ranges uh, and really explicitly pinpoint. Um, it's a real easy system, and I would refer to, uh, to that website. Tremendous tool. Okay, getting back to our wax. Um, this ski has a, a plate and bindings on there, and uh, you, you tend to want to use a lot of wax when you're doing this, and sometimes uh, it takes two or three times uh, to get the ski clean. So uh, what I like to do is I, I like to get a piece of masking tape. And uh, I'll put this masking tape just underneath the side edge onto the side wall and I will drape the ski with the, with the uh, masking tape to kind of prevent all those drips and the molten wax getting into the nooks and crannies of the plates and the bindings. It's going to prevent a lot of work after you're all done as far as scraping out all the wax that gets stuck in between uh, you know, the bindings. The, uh, the cracks of the, uh, the plates and whatnot, you can, you can uh, imagine that uh, what it does if you don't have the tape on here. It saves you a lot of work where you can spend it brushing instead of cleaning off the sidewall. So I like to put a, uh, just tape just enough to, to cover that, that plate and binding area. It's going to prevent a lot of work on down the line. All right. And your first reference would be to set your iron at that 120, 125 degree. However, um, it's, it's just your first reference. Uh, these, uh, these irons tend to uh, uh, fluctuate with the thermostat to, to keep those temperatures um, uh, consistent at that melting point that you're looking for. And sometimes they, they tend to jump up and down just a little bit. But your next reference would be smoke rolling off the iron. If you see a lot of smoke rolling off the iron, maybe you got to go down from uh, 125 to 120 or even 115. Um, the, the thermostats tend to fluctuate just a little bit on any type of iron. And uh, that's a real good adjustment to make as far as keeping that melting point consistent. Go ahead and take your yellow wax and uh, get a good bead going. And I like to don't skimp on the wax because uh, you're going to get better penetration, but you're also going to have a nice thermal layer which is going to protect the bare base uh, from the iron. You don't want to stall that iron out on a bare base or it'll close that, that area up where it stalls out. And uh, so I tend to not ever skimp out on the, on the wax because uh, of uh, the application, the penetration, and also the thermal layer that it's creating as far as keeping the heat off of the base and, and onto the wax and, and heating up that base rather than burning it. Um, your next reference as far as, uh, as far as your proper melting point would have a puddle of wax following anywhere from four to six inches behind the iron. This is a little bit more, so I'm just going to make another adjustment and turn it down. All right? and also the smoke. I'm going to wipe my iron off with a hunk of paper towel here. Is it important to clamp the ski? What's that? Loosen the ski? Um, yeah, as the ski's heating up, you want to let go of the vise a little bit so it, uh, it flattens out and you're not holding that camber and resisting. Uh, but yet again, you're going to have to clamp it back down to, to um, scrape it off. All right? which I should get my scraper ready. So again, looking for that eight, that four to six inch, excuse me, four to six inch puddle that's following the iron would be your next reference as opposed to the melting point. And just keep the iron moving. I tend to not to like to go back and forth uh, for, for reason of in case I didn't clean my bench properly and there's a little file burr Underneath there, you don't want to make a bunch of scratches. That scratch is going to go one way with the ski and blend into the, into the structure. And 90% of the times, it can be brushed in. Rather than going back, you'll see those scratches, and they won't come out for a couple weeks after brushing. So it's just little things to be conscientious of uh, that's going to allow the skis to be fast. And that's what you want. 
So getting back to our hot scraping here is I'm, uh, I'm heating the ski up a little bit more than you would as far as uh, applying a normal training wax or race wax. And as far as the thermostat adjusting, um, also, um, and, and, and looking and controlling that puddle that you're looking for um, will allow you to, to, to know if you have to slow down in the pass or speed up in the pass, okay? So as the, as the thermostat's clicking on, you're speeding up, and if it's clicking off, maybe you're slowing down or, or vice versa, okay? So don't be afraid to just heat it up a little bit. Uh, your next reference would be that you're having a little bit of a puddle here where it's not tending to, uh, to dry up as fast in the tip and in the tail, those thinner, lower profile areas of the ski. But just go ahead and work your way down. And, and my next reference to tell me that this ski is ready to scrape off the dirt is that it's, it's, it's hot to the touch in those lower profile areas in the thinner parts of the tip and tail. You can feel it and it's hot on the top skin. Okay, so go ahead and grab your, your plexiglass scraper. Make sure it's sharp. Make sure it's not too sharp where you're taking off the peaks of the structure. You want to take off the wax, but you don't want to take off the base. All right? I'm going to put this over here. There we go. So as the ski is still a little bit molten in the tip and air, tail area and it's hot to the touch, go ahead and while it's still warm, go ahead and just scrape it off. And you can see the amount of dirt that's coming off that I'm doing my job. That's your next reference telling you that, okay, I'm doing what I'm trying to do. And go ahead and repeat that. Um, you know, just go ahead and get all that wax off here. And while the ski is still warm, I'll go ahead and take my steel brush again. And I'll brush out getting deeper and hopefully rising more impurities to the surface for our next, uh, next hot scrape, okay? So go ahead and work your way down there, all the way through the ski. Don't be afraid to brush too much. And get your base techs off, out, and wipe all that, uh, that wax particles off and go ahead and repeat the process that I just showed you. And uh, sometimes it takes two or three times, sometimes it takes three or four times, depending how dirty the ski is. Keep your eye on the wax scrapings, and when you don't see any more dirt and it's pretty pure and yellow, that tells you you're there, all right? Okay, say, uh, say I did it two or three times and my base is clean right now. Uh, while uh, the, the ski has been brushed out and opened again with your steel, softer steel brush, we want to get a nice conditioning wax into the base. And most times um, I will use a, a molly. All right, because we not only pulled out a lot of the dirt, we pulled out some important properties as well that we want to put back in there, such as molybdenum, okay, which is a, an important compound, particularly in dry friction conditions, okay, when the snow is a lot drier and colder, which is, pertains to, to, to Utah here, especially this time of year. Uh, before the sun gets higher, the days get longer, and actually the, the snow tends to bond a lot more and break down in a rounder rather than broken type of snow, okay? So, at, as the ski is still warm and it's opened up with your hot, with, uh, excuse me, your, um, your uh, softer steel oval, I'll go ahead and take a, a BP Molly, base prep Molly, <clears throat> and I will find the melting point. Um, this is the same melting point as your red. Uh, which is about 130 to 140 degrees. So I would adjust my, obviously, my thermostat accordingly, and that would be your first reference, as opposed to the smoke that's rolling off. You don't want that. You might have to fluctuate here, up or down. And go ahead and get that rolling in. And again, don't be afraid to use a little bit of wax because it's only gonna be beneficial, better application and also a better protection that that, that iron is uh, less apt to stall out on the base, thus making it slower in that area where it's stalled out. Okay. 
So when your skis are just sitting around, is it good just to leave the molly on there? Yeah, it is. I would say around here, it's a good thing. And uh, that's something else I'm going to get into here after I'm done with this is just as important as it is to heat that base up and expand those pores so the wax is going deeper into the base. It's just as important that this ski cures or cools down slowly, okay? Um, that's another thing I see, see the kids doing uh, a lot is... Um, you know, they'll, uh, they, they don't allow themselves for enough time and they spend all this time getting the wax in and then they'll take the ski outside to, ha to cool down because they don't want to wake up the next morning to scrape. They, they want to get it done. And when the ski cools down too abruptly, what happens is that those pores close too fast. They contract too fast, thus pushing the wax out instead of slowly trapping them in. Okay? Thank you. So anyway, moving down here, um, again, proper, proper melting point is that four to six inch puddle and drying up behind the iron. All right? No. So, well, if, you're wet, if your iron's too hot, are you molecularly changing? Yes. The, yeah, the range. You know, you start messing with the with the with the compounds, and uh, you're starting to change the, you know, things around as far as uh, as far as temperature range. You know, you you might be going lower or higher than what that temperature range on that wax is. So melting points are critical, particularly not with AT so much as it is with if you're on the clock and trying to win. It's really critical. Okay, so. It's something to keep in mind, though, because everybody wants to, to beat their friends uh, off, off the chairlift and down the ridges, right? That you want them looking at your back. <laughs> anyway, we put on that, that protection layer, that first conditioning layer, not protection layer, conditioning layer, and put some of the properties back in that, that ski. And we want to let this ski uh, ideally sit overnight, or at least eight hours, OK? <laughs> And uh, what I'll do next is I will take a, uh, a Toco spatula. Everybody's seen these. We used to clean our, uh, our grooves out and our skis when, back when they had grooves. Um, however, you want to take all the wax off of the steel because uh, you have a lot of moisture coming off of your hands that the wax will trap in between the steel and the wax. And uh, it's going to prevent that, uh, that steel from oxidizing, even overnight. So this is, this is critical, even with the kids travel waxing. After you've waxed, get rid of that wax over the edge so it doesn't get oxidized. So you're not spending hours instead of 10 minutes uh, before a race in getting out rust. You know, oxidation is the first part of rust. So go ahead. It takes a second. It takes this fast to do it. Boom, done. Again, put it on the sidewall, get rid of all that wax on the steel of the sidewall. Okay? No, it doesn't. It traps it in. From your hands, there's, there's humidity in the air, and, and it'll happen faster than you think. It says water, No. No, it has paraffins. But anyway, um, Synthetics, it has lots of stuff in it. But anyway, it's just a good habit to get in. And after I'll scrape off the sidewall, I'll take a pot scrubber, a plastic pot scrubby, and I'll go ahead and take those drips off the sidewall, uh, whatever the spatula didn't get. You want all the residue off the sidewall, residue is slow. Okay, and I'm kind of rolling through here. Um, where can we go next? Uh, Let's see, rolling through. Uh, express waxes, uh, Toco makes a, a line of express waxes that, uh, that really are a very uh, easy type of application and less time spent. You can do it on the hill in between runs. Um, these express waxes have a, a large range on them, anywhere from zero to 20, from zero to minus 30. You know, those are huge ranges and they're easy to apply. There are a lot of times where the, the kids don't have time to go to the wax room and, and re-wax. So, um, you know, this is also something that a lot of the kids, the J45 club kids, can do. 
um, and, and mom and dad can do as far as the application um, and the benefits that you're going to get uh, on the hill um, and just getting that that uh, that ski back up to snuff to, to win hopefully the second run okay so there are different types of uh, of, of express waxes, the express mini, the express pocket, which fits in your pocket and has a, a little sponge on top, and it's an easier application for those at the start. Is it okay uh, at, at cold temperatures on the top of race hill? Or is it yeah, they, you know, they go from zero to minus 30. So, you know, if it's not any colder than minus 30, the snow so temp. Your application doesn't make any difference then? No, you know, especially if he doesn't have time to, to go down and wax, you know, in between runs. It's something to take into consideration. But, oh, but when you're applying this, you always want to make sure and brush the ski out with a copper brush first. Uh, after you've taken one run, um, you know, it's torn out a lot of that race wax that you put in, and you just want to make sure that that structure is nice and cleaned out. And also the copper will help uh, leave that film, that durability from that previous wax on the nooks and crannies of that structure and the express wax will be the icing on the cake uh, in between. Um, you get up into the up into the uh, the older kids um, we have our jet stream our jet stream block which is our, uh, our high fluorinated overlays um, again uh, in blue, red, and yellow, so it's really easy. Temperature ranges are the same. Um, and what we do with these is uh, we like to crayon them in. Uh, they're a little bit easier to work with than some of the powders. Jetstream makes powders. However, the powders are best uh, worked inside and not out on the hill. Uh, the applications are more precise and easier. Uh, the wind won't blow them off your ski, and you won't have $50 worth of Jetstream blowing down the hill. Um, these are a lot easier. The block form is easy to work with. And when I'm doing this, I like to crayon in from tail to tip. Okay, we brush from tip to tail. However, your application of block overlays ten, tend to get in a lot deeper and a lot more consistent going against the grain. Okay, so I don't know if any of you guys have heard this before, but it's something uh, it adds to the durability. Also, it's not going to it's not going to tear out, you know, two thirds down the down the course. It's going to last through the finish. So I like to crayon the uh, the jet stream block from tail to tip. Concentrate on nice even pressure. We're looking for an even film rather than downward pressure. You start clumping it up, and uh, it's going to it's going to be slower than having more consistent film just because of the consistency. All right, and uh, once that's clumped up, it's a little bit harder to brush out in those areas where it's clumped up. So the application we're looking for is a nice, consistent crayon, light crayon from the width of the ski, okay? And just go ahead and do that from tail to tip. And uh, after we're done with that, um, I like to use a rotor cork. Um, sometimes you always can't rotor cork at the top of the hill. Unless, uh, unless you have a battery and, uh, and a table set up there. Or unless Renstall's on top for you. That's right. Renstall's up there giving it for you guys. Just bring them over to Eric. Tell them to juice them. Brand new Honda generation. We're here for you. Nice. Okay, and uh, you can also hand cork. Mm, anyway, rotocork. cork. cork. I think there was one out there. I don't see it anymore, Ian. I had one out. Okay, uh, rotor corking. I like to rotor cork start out from tail to tip also because the, the, the rotation of that cork will help heat up that material and get it down deep. Thanks, Ian. And we'll get it down deep for a better, faster, more durable type of application. However, you want to keep, um, you want to keep the, uh, the revolutions down. That's too much. What that does is it creates too much heat, and it'll push, uh, it'll it'll push it down too deep and gum it up too much, where you really can't get a proper brushing. So uh, a better application would be at a lower rotor, uh, would be at a lower RPM with no downward pressure. So actually, you're letting the cork do all the work rather than the pressure or the ro or the uh, RPMs of the uh, of the drill. 
So I like to, to make my first pass from tail to tip. Just to kind of get it in the opposite way we brush. No, no, and you know when I when I get to some of my brushes, you know, for the final polishing such as nylon or synthetic horsehair, I will apply a little bit of pressure, but I'll also use a little bit of water spritz to kind of keep that heat and friction down a little bit and bring that polish uh, to a nice durability. I'll just get a, a little bit of a water bottle with my uh, my roto brushes and uh, make a spritz down the base. Okay, and just going through this. Um, how about some questions? We're, we're kind of running out of time here. And Willie, yeah. Uh, lately in the, in the Intermountain West, we've had some big fires, and we're, we're having dust, dirt events when we have bigger storm cycles coming in. Right. And I got no glide. Molly. 10, 20 times last year, no glide whatsoever. Molly. Straight Molly on the base with no wax. Sure. Thin or brushed or what? Um... You know, I would, I would definitely go molly underneath, like I, I just put on here. I'd melt it in there. And uh, as far as your overlays go, I would go with, you know, whatever, whatever the jet stream range per tail, whether it's blue, red, or, uh, or yellow. Um, you want to do it with the underlay or the molly. Have you dealt with this? Um, with these dirt events and no. with what you do? No, I like to ski in snow. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes snow comes with dirt these days. Yeah, a lot of times it does, you know, but I think that, you know, the application. Take care of it? Yeah, it will. Okay, thank you. It will. You, you bet. Questions? Got to wrap it up. Yeah. So do you, you, don't, you don't recommend using a battery operated drill for any portion or anything? Like I do. But right here at this present time, I have an electric one. I have a battery operated one at home, and it's a lot easier to throw in your backpack because there's nowhere to plug in a, a thing. Yes, sir. If you're not quite ready to buy an iron and do it that way, right? It, your express wax, whatever I just did with it. There's your best friend if you don't like ironing, right there. Um, if you don't like ironing, I got a Toco iron for 74 bucks with, you know, and then you get your discount for master. So. We can get you an iron that's you know that, super cheap and really be end that, That's a great price. And, and, and if, you're interested, if you're interested in winning, you want to iron in the wax if you're on the clock. Are you a master's racer? Yeah. Well, how, how much are you getting beat by now? How much are you getting beat by in your age group now? As far as what's the most? Okay. Well, if you don't want to be DFL anymore, get away from that and start going to this. Okay. Yeah. Helix spray. Okay. Thank you. Helix spray would be um, would be the final icing on the cake as far as uh, the high fluorinated. Uh, Waxes, uh, it's something that you want to spray on uh, if you're rubbing on the wax like I just showed you afterwards. And I like to apply it from tail to tip, about uh, anywhere from 7 inches to uh, 12 inches off the ski. And just make sure that you get a nice application there. And it just adds to the durability in the layers as the ski is, is going down the hill. This stuff is coming off and tearing out of the hill. You want to smooth that out with the pads real quick while it's moist? No. Let it dry. No, no, no. You have to let this dry. I would recommend anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes. And uh, as you can see now, it's starting to dry out. You want it a powder form. Um, I highly recommend doing this inside um, because a lot of times you don't have enough time in between runs to do this and if you go down that second run in liquid form which I've seen it is slow so really allow for that uh, that helix spray to dry out and really saturate into the bases our downhill skis uh, during this 8 to 15 minutes on the World Cup I used to turn them upside down so uh, it's evaporating into the base more, okay? Dry, you gonna touch it or polish it? Or yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. As soon as it dries out, they make a, a thermo pad, um, which, uh, 
I should have said uh, the yellow part here tends to act more as a brush uh, after you've put the jet stream on. So you really want to kind of open that base up a little bit for this next application. And uh, as opposed to just spraying it like I, I just did, you want to make sure and uh, have that 8 to 15 minutes. But also looking at the ski in reference, sometimes uh, the atmosphere or or uh, the environment that you're in will change that 8 to 15 minutes. You, it's important that you wait until uh, that helix spray dries out, okay, before you start using the felt side of your helix spray thermo pad and, uh, and rubbing it in. Just create a little friction and, and rubbing it in. And again, I go from tail to tip just because it gets in deeper and it's a better application the opposite way you brush, okay? So, it doesn't take uh, long at all and you can see the effects that it has and then uh, once that, uh, all that dust is getting into the ski and um, you want to go ahead and take your, your softer helix brush or your softer nylon brush and I'll start from tail to tip because we're concentrating on uh, not really brushing it out, but massaging it in and cleaning out the structure. Okay, so don't be afraid to back brush in this situation here. And it's, so do it's done like so. With the type of additives we're working with, I mean ventilation, yeah. Spine, yeah, Eric's just bringing up a real good safety subject here. You want to make sure that a door is open um, whenever you're ironing in powders, your powder applications, which add to the durability rather than crayoning them in. That's something that you want to do inside. Um, and also, uh, just make sure that you wear a respirator so you're not breathing in this smoke. Uh, uh, it's it's not really that toxic as everybody thinks it is, but you know you don't want to be breathing it in anyway. I've been breathing it in for years, and uh, you know it's, I try to wear a respirator whenever I can. But it's 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 fairly you know you can eat the stuff. It's not really that toxic as everybody thinks it is. The smoke is more toxic uh, you know than the than the material itself. Okay, so go ahead and finish up with your softer nylon helix brush and what I'll do is I'll just kinda take a thermo pad uh, your helix thermo pad and just get rid of that that residue and you'll see the effects um, as far as it being real shiny and polished um, that's your reference telling you that, that it's done okay questions thank you for coming if, if you go to